you are each individually and we collectively in this room have been set a task, which is do we need to do a turnaround? And do we need to do a turnaround of the global economy? If we have got the ability to shape it, which is the construct that we'll work with, is it fit for purpose as it stands, or does something need to be done about it? And this first seminar is taking a macro view from 20,000 feet up. First day on the job, the task is get the global economy into shape to meet the challenges it faces. So what are they? What are the things you want to hook onto pretty early on? And the very first thought is, first day on the job, if you know what to do, talk to some people. Find out who are the experts and what are their views. And so we did conjure together a, a series of experts. Um, and they each proclaimed in various quarters, probably uh, as, as oracles in this area. Um, each has a particular point of view around sustainability, around climate change. Uh, anybody know who that, not know who that is or know who that is? Tim Jackson. Yes, Tim Jackson, who wrote the book on um, uh, prosperity without growth, um, was an advisor to the Labour government. This person? Stern. 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 This person? <laughs> Hawking. The devil. The, the devil. <laughs> well, the, the devil has lost quite a bit of weight since he was the devil. He's now um, father of Nigella. And, um, and the person that, whose defeat Diana is running away from. Who? Each has a particular perspective on sustainability around climate change. Which of them would you associate this view, which we um, characterise as better rather than more, where the current economic model is no longer valid, economic growth is unsustainable, looking towards reduced consumption, looking towards equality and a moral more moral idea of the economy than the one that evolves from the um, liberal economic model. Which of these guys here would you associate with this particular point of view? Yeah. There he goes. Popular playwright and um, uh, climate economist. Which point of view would you associate this, the, the, what we characterise as adapt, not fight? That globing, global warming, if it is real, will have only a moderate impact. We can live with that impact. Uh, the main thing is we should not do stuff that hinders growth. And we should really focus on developing new technology, geoengineering, um, as a sort of just-in-case measure. Who would you associate Or well, yeah, it's it is really it's Lawson's position. Um, science will solve it. We'll get on with clean energy. We'll come up with technological fixes. We will remove. Uh, we'll get involved in um, uh, carbon dioxide removal or solar radiation management. We'll have big blue skies ideas. Um, such as nuclear fusion. These will materialise. We put the effort into that. This will solve the problems that we face. Who would you associate that with? That's um, yeah. It's actually it's it's brown. It is a bit of both. A bit of brown, some big bit of Hawking. Anybody who anybody who read the um, the uh, the thing in the Guardian a few or oh, months or so ago about the gods of science will see that Hawking, Brian Cox were um, advocating this type of point of view. Um, I liked the idea that in that um, uh, that one of the gods of science was um, uh, Dawkins. Um, the green growth, green growth for good. Um, that here we've got a point of view that is really that green growth is an opportunity. Green growth, the, the problems posed particularly around climate change, are an opportunity for growth and prosperity. 
Yeah, this is, I think there are only two left, aren't they? So we have Stern and Obama perhaps taking slightly different takes. This is more an economist take, this is more the political take, but essentially coming up to that position. We put these, we put these people um, there as our oracles on this because they are the people that are setting or trying to set agendas about how we move forwards in, and how we move business forwards in terms of tackling um, sustainability challenges. We'll come back to them in later seminars in more detail, dig further deeply into what their visions actually mean. Um, where we are today is we're going to be looking at what we've, with a question mark, talked about as the marvellous marvellous mistake. We're going to talk about the environment within which business operates, the environment seen from a variety of different sustainability perspectives. In the seminar next week, and all the seminars will be online, so it would be lovely if you could come to all of them, but you will be able to see them all online, both in full and edited versions. But the next one is going to focus much more on what business itself can do within that environment, and we've called that the turnaround challenge. The third one gets <coughs> further into this idea of incongruence, and we'll come back to and explain why this series is called incongruence. Hopefully that will become very apparent as we move forward. And then in the final one, in uh, four weeks' time, we'll be looking at um, some of the potential ways forward on this, good growth and other paths to congruence. But let me hand over to our man in the, in the C-suite. Thank you. OK, so we had six men coming up with their guidance to us as collective CEOs. The question is going to be, are any of these men, generally white, correct in the type of guidance that they are spitting out? And is it <coughs> adequate what they are coming up with? And what we propose to do as step two on the first day of the job is to sort of ground truth some of this range of advice from these possible oracles against the data, against the facts. So we're going to go out and do a little bit of a site visit of what is actually going on out there. And I'm about to show you a snapshot of the site visit. And this is the only site visit we do. And it is coming up. So the question, first of all, which um, country is this? Which continent? Thoughts? What country could it be? South Africa? South Africa? Yeah. It could be South Africa. It could be parts of Brazil. It could be Chad. It could be Haiti. It could be Glastonbury. Could be Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. <laughs> but it is Katrina. OK, it's New Orleans on a bad day. Um, it's the richest country in the world. <coughs> it's the richest country in the world. Um, so what I propose we do collectively is take a minute, find a neighbour who looks intelligent. Um, if you struggle, just move discreetly somewhere else to another <laughs> spot. Um, find a neighbour, and this is all the information you've got okay, about, the, about the system. It's all the information you've got. Just kick the tires on this a bit and ask yourself the question, does it look like these guys have got their act together? Or are there certain things that appear not to be working quite as you might want them to be? Okay? Take a minute or so with a neighbour or two. What stands out as maybe requiring a little bit of a tweak? Would anyone want to live there? Would anyone want to live there? It's a mess, isn't it? It's a, it depends on what? David, what? Aye, okay. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right, it looks a bit of a mess. What, what stands out? What stands out? What do you notice? No whites. No whites. Well, there are some. That's interesting. There are some. It's kind of good to see that. There are, there are some whites, but the vast majority is African American. The va okay, so what does that tell you about the system? Why are the African Americans there and the whites gone? It could just be there's a little bit of, a, of an inequality issue. In particular, the blacks have got nothing by way of privatized transport to get out, okay, as a possibility. 
that you've got an income distribution issue. What else do you notice? There's a bit of a rubbish issue. Yes. Okay. So we've likely got a system that is highly resource intensive in terms of its packaging that is not factoring in any of these costs. Okay. Your interpretive analysis is wonderful. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Thanks a lot. What else? What else do you notice? Umbrellas and weather, therefore. Interesting. Yeah, big time umbrellas. What do you notice about the biodiversity here? Yeah. It's human, it's human or it's concrete. What was the biodiversity that was there? New Orleans. What did they used to have? Jazz. What? Jazz. <laughs> 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 this, if Angela's going to be disruptive, I'll let you to join with me in ejecting her from it. Okay. Jazz. What about the, the natural biodiversity they used to have in New Orleans? Marsh. Marshes. And in particular, they had, they had mangroves. Okay. What was the economic function of the mangroves? Flood absorption, yeah, exactly. That that's what they had. What did the GDP model do? Well, that biodiversity got chopped down to make way for high-priced real estate, jazz clubs, etc., condominiums, etc., which lodged it, of course, as an asset. Meanwhile, what they'd also created was a liability, which was the removal of the flood absorption system. Okay, according to the man on the wall there, Al Gore, what was the cause of this event? Climate change. Okay, so again, you've got with the auto industrial economy that you see with the eight lane superhighway, you've got an unchallenged set of emissions, again, creating growth, but also, according to St. Al, lodging up an externality that is waiting to get internalized, according to Sir Nick, um, at a multiple in terms of its costs to the original economic value that has been created. In other words, what you've got here. Um, is something possibly of an announcement of a future. That if this is the richest nation on earth, this is the richest nation on earth doing something logical, which is applying its current growth-based model and arriving at a moment where it runs up against the constraints of that in terms of air, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of poverty, and seeing the combination of those trends creating something which has a growth negative effect and which doesn't work even in the terms of the economic model itself. In other words, what you've got here is the snapshot of a car crash. And this is the richest country on earth, therefore, logically, this is something that is potentially a risk that is valid for other <coughs> poorer nations as well. Okay. So we've seen in this one shot an economic system getting exposed to certain megatrends, sustainability megatrends, that could hurt. Mick, over to you. But excuse me, Leo. Please. Are you happy to entertain a quick question? Ent I'm totally entertaining. My answer will not be entertaining, but it will, I will absolutely entertain it, yeah. What would be your answer to the proposition that there are different ways of interpreting that, for example, that is, it might not necessarily be about the growth or economic model, but about governance issues. My answer would be that I would agree with that interpretation. And what one, of the, one of the things we want to be looking at is the relationship between economic model and political, economic, social, technological, legal governance forms, all of which will be congruent with that model. And that's because that's, you know, you, you're putting your, your, your finger on something crucial there. Mick, over to you. Megan. Okay. You have been, you've been on your site visit. Megan is going to give me exactly five minutes to try and interpret some of what you have seen on that, on that and put it into a broader perspective. We have a situation where we are confronting resource constraints. This is slightly old data, but the, the trend is still downwards. The per capita arable land is, is on, the, on the decrease. Uh, we have a situation where the ownership of land is changing significantly. This is just one example of the UAE investors buying up land in Pakistan. There's a very interesting graphic about how different people from different countries are buying land up all around the world and how there's obviously land doesn't shift, not too much. 
Um, but the ownership of land has shifted enormously geographically in recent times. Um, we have the, this is the annual food price index. So we have food rising up from the early 1990s, doubling as over a 10 year period. Um, we have the issue with fresh water, um, that for many companies, water itself is seen as, a, uh, as an issue. Nestle would say that water is a bigger issue than climate change. Um, and so you have uh, my boss, David King's uh, successor, um, John Beddington, concluding that here we have a situation, the challenge of that we need 50% more production on less land with less water and using less energy, and to do all that by 2030. And we see with the changing water availability, this is starting off in the 1990s where it goes in, the red areas show that there's water stress, um, and this is what it would look like into the 2050s. So significant water stress all around here. And for Megan, who comes from South Africa, particularly bad news. Um, that's why she's moved here. Um, and this is part also linked into the, the demographic shift. Here we were in 1950. We had uh, two and a bit billion people one and uh, slightly under one billion of those people were in the developed countries, developed e economies at the time. Um, one and a half um, billion were in developing countries. We can see how this has shifted. This is uh, well, somewhere in between is where we are now. The de developed economy populations have not shifted, but the developing economy nations have definitely shifted and will continue to shift. From a business perspective, you say, well, my markets have shifted here. Um, but from a, um, from a sustainability perspective, it raises all kinds of um, separate issues. That part of that shift is also between uh, urban and rural. If these are the emerging economies, the bulk of that growth is happening in urban areas. Uh, less of it is happening in rural areas. Um, similarly, um, you have urban growth where there is growth in um, developed economies. Uh, you have that growth happening in um, urban areas. And yet alongside that population growth, we have this that came out last week, the week before from the EU, of wanting to boost births. Um, that the tension around population is not simply about how do you uh, reduce population. In parts of the world like the, uh, Europe, we're now advocating that we should increase births um, in order to address uh, the flagging birth rates um, that are a feature of that population stagnation. We have the good news within that, that with that growth in population, with the growth in the economy, that everybody is rich. $125 trillion is sloshing around. Uh, about $20,000 each per person. The average family in the US is over 50,000. Here it's uh, 23,000. But of course, that is unevenly divided. Um, you've got the population share here and the share of global wealth down here. That's for China. Population share here, share of global wealth. And this figure here is representing, this is what the, the, the top 10% has the share of wealth in Europe. Um, and this is, sorry, this is the top 1% and this is the top 10%. So an unequal spread in terms of how that wealth is distributed. You've got disparity within the countries. You, um, if you are poor in Denmark, there's probably a better situation to be than poor in Brazil um, and indeed in the USA. We have trends in income inequality. Um, and we have the trends in, um, in climate change, where we are moving and this is the latest figures from, um, from the poll that uh, recording 389 parts per million in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, emissions. And yet we have a situation where to stabilize global warming at two degrees centigrade by 2100, the concentration levels need to be no more than 450. If this data is correct, it means we've got about 60 parts per million to play with. Um, and that's time. Oh gosh, and I didn't even get on to the nice bits about, um, about what that climate change would mean for a place like Benin. But it is circular, as Chuck says, this is 
as points out, this is not something that you can say, I'm going to approach this as an economic problem. It is all interrelated. Um, and you do get to the situation where one of the basic challenges, particularly if you're looking out from the C-suite, is how do you go to a situation where you have these, uh, uh, this kind of carbon budget, up to 25 um, uh, tons of carbon dioxide uh, or equivalent emissions per person a year, down to, um, down to the five gigatons. And that brings us back to Katrina. Okay, I never thought Mick would do it, but that was generally, that was like five minutes on the mega trends. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That is um, everything that would That's make normally a three-hour tonight. presentation. That was, so you've been saved. You've been saved a whole evening of turge. Okay, um, Mick, brilliant. So look, so the question is, you've just been given, you know, punch after punch between the eyeballs in terms of where this economy appears to be heading. What do you focus on first? And is it water? Is it poverty? Is it inequality? Is it biodiversity issues? What do you focus on first? And I think, I, mean, I just came back from Nairobi. I just came back from the, the, the Mathari slum in Kenya yesterday morning, where I was for four days. And you know, what you see there, I'm slightly off script here, Mick, but what you see there is this scuff comes together, that there is water scarcity, there is urbanization, there is massive poverty, there is massive inequality. But one of the factors that is amplifying all of these is climate change, where the drought has caused the prices of water to go up it's by 130%. It's caused the prices of maize to go up. It's made people flee the rural communities going towards the city centres. It's increased the urbanisation. And you've just got this car crash of a place that's the size of, of Central Park in New York with 800,000 people in it with pretty little chances to get out. That if all these mega trends exist, you know, if water is is the shark, then climate change is the teeth. That's the thing that's going to make it bite. And if you look here, we can have in the Katrina, we can have all these standing conditions of the megatrends here around inequality, around biodiversity loss. But you aren't going to be able to solve them if you cannot get rid of, manage the problem of climate change as a priority, which is going to worsen and amplify and create negative interdependencies between all the rest of them. So what we want to look at is that challenge as a primary focus of, of climate change. So if there are, to use a, a very sort of primitivistic analogy, if there are storm clouds, if there are clouds, which are the existing set of megatrends, but a new storm, a new larger storm forming around climate change, have we got the equipment, have we got the craft to deal with it? and to fly, to sail our way out? Have we got the ability to navigate the uncertainty that is coming up or not? So what we'd like to do now is to take a look at the specific challenges of, of climate change and like to roll out some scenarios and do a sort of collective creation of what we think a credible scenario is for where we're going to be headed by 2050. I'm going to throw these out. This is going to be a pretty complicated diagram. So if you see anyone next to you falling asleep, just let them go. Let them drift and it's going to be fine. Okay. All right. So look. And this is, um, there's a study on this, which I, com which I commissioned at PwC with this amazing egg-headed economist team who did it. But this is a simplification of it. GDP um, per capita on the horizontal, emissions per capita on the vertical. And what you see predictably is as countries industrialize, both go up, Fine, okay? And you've got a business as usual model. Call it the Nigel Lawson model, where what we need to do and the business advice is keep on growing. And keep on growing because the poor need us to keep on growing. And the rich want us to keep on growing, so keep on growing. Then you've got a few who say there is this dotted red line. And this dotted red line represents a cumulative concentration of carbon in the atmosphere which we do not want to exceed. Call it 350 parts per million, call it 450 parts per million if you're feeling generous. It represents a level beyond which, if we breach it, there may be accelerated points of impact, feedback loops, etc. Okay? So let's call it two degrees of warming. Fine. So scenario one is there is no problem. 
Scenario two is there is a problem. That red line exists, and what we want to do is respect that red line and not breach it and create a different form of growth, which is a growth that decouples carbon from growth and where we decarbonize by <coughs> roughly 80% by 2050. Okay? That's what, of course, Copenhagen was shooting, shooting for. That's scenario two. Scenario three is different again, which is that if you look at Katrina, if you look at Benin, if you look at the Maldives, if you look at Bangladesh, what you start to see <coughs> is sudden or gradual climate change-driven reductions in economic development. In other words, looking, excuse me, looking, it's actually scenario four that I'm talking about, looking like scenario four there. Scenario three, scenario three is different again, which is where scenario four is the pessimistic scenario, okay, that there is a problem and we don't quite manage to deal with it. Scenario three is there is a problem and when and only when we start to see hardcore <coughs> material impacts being economically visible, we respond. And we respond by geoengineering, <coughs> cloud seeding the stratosphere, changing the alkalinity of the sea, reflective lenses in space, you name it. Okay? So what I'd like you to do is just cogitate for a minute. Find a sparring partner again, two or three, and come to a consensus on not where you hope, but where you think. Where you think at the global level, not at the UK level, but at the global level, we are going to be by 2050. Which of those scenarios? And there could be combinations, of course. Take a minute with a sparring partner or two. All right, let's go through. Make some sort of a noise or something. We'll just, just get a sense in the room of who thinks what. All right, scenario one, there is no problem. The optimistic scenario. No. <laughs> right, okay, all right. Sorry, we've got, we got, we got no takers. All right. Scenario two, there is a problem and we're going to deal with it. I, you know, it's the second time I've been in Oxford. It's just the most incredibly gloomy, pessimistic <laughs> audience. <laughs> I'm not, last time I got really upset. All right. We right. did have a comment here, which was that some, some regions may experience versions of two. So About the global level. No, no. You know, nature's not going to say, you know, give me a, you know, a nice try there. Okay, fine, all right. At the global level, what is it about Oxford? Okay, all right, fine, all right. Scenario four, that we're going to see sudden or gradual climate change-driven reductions in economic development. Please raise a hand. Okay, okay. Scenario three, we will turn to geoengineering. Okay, okay. Keep your hands up for a second. Raise them high. Raise them high and proud. Okay, now, please up, 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 hold up so we can see it. All right. Now, please keep your hand up if you think the geoengineering will work. Well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, fine. But there's a lot of people in here. There's a whole cluster of non, non. It'll be a combination. It'll be a combination. Yeah, like scenario one and a half. <laughs> or three point or possibly a combination of, 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 of three and three and two. Okay. So there's a big question, of course, whether you know, in these scenarios, what you see is um, there are radically different winners and losers from a business perspective. And we'll explore these in coming seminars. What are the business implications? Scenario one, the whole clean tech industry out of the window. Scenario two, fossil fuels out of the window. Scenario four, losses across the board. Scenario three, very interesting, because is geoengineering a substitute? Is it, you know, is it like a sort of carbon slim fast pill that you can pop while retaining the same binge carbon diet? Is it, or is it a complement? Is it one part of a, of a diet that helps us get back onto scenario two? Please. Your parameters don't allow for a Jackson or David scenario. Excellent. So, is there a convergence instead around a group, for example, there, where there are adequate meetings of basic needs and there's not a growth based growth for the sake of growth model? So, hold that because we'll get onto that. But, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 
What I'd like to throw out is some of the numbers that we, that we did on this. Um, okay, so if we'd started decarbonizing in 2000 to achieve the 80% goal by 2050, roughly what decrease per year, what increase in carbon productivity would we have needed? Anyone know? 4% year on year improvement. Two. Two. Yeah, you'd think it's going to be 4, 2%. What did we achieve from 2000? Anyone know? Actually, at the global level, in terms of carbon productivity, the amount of growth squeezed out for a fixed amount of carbon, we did reduce, actually. But instead of reducing by 2%, we reduced by 0.8%. What does that mean? It means basically we've gone over carbon budget. We've got a fixed amount of carbon. If we're going to grow, as planned, by 2050, GDP targets, it's a fixed amount of carbon. We've got to squeeze more growth out of a lesser amount of carbon. But instead of 2%, we did 0.8%, which means we've blown the budget. We've gone over by 13.4 gigatons since 2000. How much is that? That's China and the US together for a year. To get back on track, someone's got to ask China and the US quite politely to turn off their lights for a year. Our 2050 budget on this burn rate, we run out of our carbon by 2034. So we have 16 years where the choice is either to turn off the lights completely or breach that red line with the consequences that we don't fully understand. Um, so in other words, we've got a sort of carbon beer belly that we've managed to acquire, carbon moves, if that helps you identify it as a, we have gone over the limit. And the question is, can we get back on track? Can we get rid of the carbon beer belly or not? What do we now need to do? Because of that failure, we now need to decarbonize at a greater rate. Last year, 2008, we needed to decarbonize not at 2%, but at 3.4%. This year, and these numbers haven't come out yet, but we just run them, it's now 3.8%. Even with the recession, we have blown our budget further. So it's now 3.8%. So the question is, is that doable? Is it doable? Well, it's interesting to look at this. Uh, Russia, from 1990 to 2008, managed 7% year on year. But a lot of that was with two factors. One was a highly efficient state-owned set of enterprises. The other was with quite large periods of economic collapse. China, from 2000 to 2008, averaged about 4%, which is interesting because it was with growth, but again, it was with a starting base of some highly inefficient state-owned enterprises. So what it looks like is that we're sort of at the edge of the decarbonization frontier, it appears. Um, and the real question is, it's within the bounds of what the technologies appear to offer, but the real question appears to be capital. What does this capital involve at a time when the UK government just gave us one billion for the Green Investment Bank deferred till 2013? What does this capital involve? Well, it appears to involve, at the global level, something like 430 billion from now till 2020, 1.15 trillion a year from 2020 to 2050. Let's put some of these numbers in context. If this is uh, what we did in terms of public spending cuts, 81 billion just now, then the gray box is the UK's share, according to GDP, balanced of the total carbon investment that is actually going to be required to make this happen. In other words, a multiple of the cuts that we just did. Is that task doable, you ask? Is it politically doable within the context we've got? As a little last point before I hand back over to Nick and just hold the question for just a second, let's put it into another context again which is this figure. <laughs> OK. Sorry, can we take a, a, a brief question? Is it? Yeah, does that need to be public sector spending? Excellent question, which we'll get on to. And the question is, how do you create the economic incentives to mobilize that private capital? So if we come back to our airplane coming through they can't dodge the clouds. It's coming into this cloud bank. 
One thing you might not have noticed earlier about the airplane is that um, it's a very nice airplane, it's in the clouds, it's only got one engine. Um, kind of a bit unfortunate. We need, from the situation that Leo's describing, we need a very fit, very healthy, um, uh, top of the range Learjet to get us through this, something that's very nimble. What we've actually got is something that looks a bit like Budgie the helicopter on a bad day when the parts have started to fall off. Um, and part of that is a lot of the talk is around, we need this much investment. And it is as if there's a big pot of money out there and if only we could find, get that big pot of money and move it over into the right places. It's as if that money doesn't belong to anybody. It's there out in the global economy. We can just shift it across. Um, and we've, Leo gave some of the figures for that. The, for investment in the low carbon economy, we've got 4.7 trillion by 2020, 1.1 point trillion thereafter. 156 billion net new investment annually, um, according to the UNFCC. FCCC. Um, for energy substitution alone, 10.5 trillion, and so on and so forth. We start to get lost in the number of zeros. What does finding this degree of investment involve? Well, it requires a lot of risk tolerant capital going into innovative technologies with the promise of high returns. That is how you are going to get from the idea that there is big chunks of money just eager to be pouring into this, into money actually moving into this kind of investment. And yet, what we have today, we've got highly indebted economies offering high interest on gilts to pay for sovereign debt. This is made possible by high levels of savings that reduce, public spe uh, that reduce private spending, so the consumer demand isn't there. And UK gilt rates, 5%, US treasuries, about 4.5%. Already you're setting the bar for any new investment at what would historically be starting to move towards quite a high level for, um, uh, in terms of the expected returns compared to what you can get elsewhere in something that is very, very safe. You've got highly indebted companies. Um, UK non-financial corporate debt is over 110% of UK GDP. In Spain, it's 140%. Uh, UK financial corporate debt is nearly 200% of GDP. Don't forget, you should take the cuts uh, because you have caused this debt. Sorry, that's a, just a little political offline part. <laughs> um, we all know that people have an Oxford education come out on top. Um, cash rich companies with overcapacity. This idea that people like this guy, I mean, not clearly the friends of coal, but somehow the corporations are going to start wanting to, that the, the, they are prepared to invest in these new technologies. Well, they've got cash rich com companies already over capacity. Um, they've got nothing to, else to spend the money on. They're just issuing bonds. You've got a severely damaged venture capital sector. A lot of the hope that was going to go into the new technologies would be come from venture capital. Um, in Europe and USA, venture capital was about 140 billion in 2000, um, 50 billion <coughs> in 2007. Social venture capital today is about 3 billion. Venture capital is not going to be the solution to this in the way that certain analysts continue to portray it. You've got a severely ba damaged bank sector. You've got very bubble-wary, risk-averse pension schemes holding a lot of this money. Um, also endowments, also foundation investments. These are not risk-takers. These are risk-averse, partly out of legal duty, nothing else. And you've got rich world savers staring at ta uh, rich world savers. Sorry, I pointed to the wrong part. You've got rich world savers, who are not represented there, um, staring at tax hikes, 
and spending cuts. Spending cuts, tax hikes together, could be the equivalent of 1.25% of collective GDP. Altogether, you have a very, very unfavourable investment environment for something where we keep coming back to this idea that we're going to invest our way out of this. So we have the technologies on offer. We have a technology-based solution. David Mackay at Cambridge has done this analysis for the UK. It would be very nice if it was done for other countries, but it represents, this is the energy we use, conventional energy. This is what we could have if we turn to renewable energy. And it would leave us about 28.5 kilowatt hours per day per person short. Not a significant amount, but as he points out, if you break that down, there's a difference between what we could have and what we will allow, and you start to lose because of things like cost, because of things like not in my backyard, because of things like defence considerations. And so where you actually end up, according to Mackay's, is you've got this gap, 177. So immediately you've got this technological challenge, and you, that was the UK figures. You can see something similar worldwide if you compare the current capacity additions for these different... Uh, energy technologies with the, um, the hoped for uh, annual ad additions. You can see the grey line is always significantly, except in the case of hydro, the grey line is also always significantly less than the expectations in order to keep um, uh, the uh, sustainable energy strategy on track. So is that a question of the technology doesn't exist or the technology exists but the economics is not falling into place properly? Part of that, e eco that economic solution was in the um, emissions trading schemes. What this diagram really shows is how flat and how low the, um, the price of carbon has been in recent times. And somebody like David King would argue that in order for the carbon markets to serve their purpose in terms of reducing um, carbon emissions, they need to be up, the price needs to be up in about 200. Here it is, it's less than 16. Another way of looking at it is that what sustainability, what climate change what green technology offers is something really, really exciting for investors. It's going to outperform conventional markets. Anybody who has read sustainable, um, uh, sustainable investment texts, books, articles, literature, publicity, will know the, the promise of offering these long-term, high-performing uh, op investment opportunities. One of the most pronounced and uh, the most popular is uh, most developed is the Winslow Green Growth Fund in the, in the US. And certainly you see here, go back to 2005, that promise was fulfilled. It outperformed the Dow Jones Index of leading shares. However, at the time when the financial crisis hit, rather than see the Dow Jones tail off, which of course, relatively speaking, in absolute terms it did, but this significantly underperformed the market. The sustainable investment underperformed the market. Now, if we want this patient, <coughs> risk-tolerant capital flowing into this, what signal does that performance suggest? So then we come into Perhaps it can't be reliant on the financial markets. Perhaps there's got to be other things. Um, and so we have the government investment. We have the announcements, again, using the UK as, a, as an example, that the UK is pouring money into um, green technology. And, of course, that amount is the equivalent of the budget for Pirates of the Caribbean 3. <laughs> <laughs> The government came up with 200, 200 million pounds, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and this, the budget for this was um, 
$350 million. So this moves the ball over. We talked about the technology, the technology looking to the economics, the economics now having to look to the politicians. And we mentioned before Barack Obama. Well, interestingly, Barack Obama, we compared him with Stern, but he's actually got quite a lot in common with Nigel Lawson over time. Um, coming back to this, remember this bank bailout that was going on, the size of that. If you look at the green stimulus packages that were put in by various governments around the world, sorry, the, the stimulus packages to get us out of the financial crisis, and the green component of those, um, China put in 221 billion as a green component of its stimulus package. 112 billion by the US. South Korea, um, in terms of percentage of GDP, in terms of per capita, was by far the biggest investor. Britain put in 2 billion into that. This was all the investment made in about 2008. And although we hear the talk of green governments, green policies, really wanting this. You know, we get down to the local council level, we look at where the governments are looking. Which figures would you put with which statement? Of course, the approved at planning applications, the, num the percentage of planning applications for wind farms that was approved in the last 12 months, 25%. What goes into old technology, Roads, supermarkets, other major infrastructure, 70% of that got approved. What do you think that is? This is the wonderful wordle, which is probably the worst thing to come across researchers' desks. It makes us look interesting. When <laughs> but what do you think that that is uh, an analysis of? It, it, it was an event, I'll tell you that. The spending review. This was the Conservative Party Conference Green Growth Day. <laughs> this is an analysis of the words. I challenge you to find the word green in there. Um, it was about child benefit. It was about caps. It was about cutting back the BBC. There is a mention of a train, but it was about high-speed trains, which are not necessarily, uh, as we'll come on to when we look at particular industries, they're not necessarily um, the solution to this. Um, you have the government, I want this government to be the greenest government ever. And then last week, this announcement, the forensic relentless focus on growth is what you will get from this government. That, of course, is David Cameron. This is the governator himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger, as champion of the environment. And this is his announcement, having come back from South Korea. Oh, I always say I want to see cranes everywhere. And so if you take these things by one by one, economics, technology, politics, and so on and so forth, what you find <coughs> is that each of them is treated in silos as if each one can be a solution. And yet each time those silos butt up against one of the, um, another one. And as a conclusion to, to today's presentation, um, and as a prelude for what we're going to explore further next week, Leo's going to talk us through um, some of our ideas about why that situation has been allowed to occur. Cool. This is just a final slide to preview next week. And it really gets to your point, which is, is this about governance and is this about a system that's related? So if you take the avatars, if you take the oracles we looked at before, the, the white men and what they said, have any of them offered us advice that's actually fit for purpose? Has any of them come up with something that does respond to the particular set of challenges we've got in terms of a strategy that is implementable? And what we want to explore is that incongruence that could it be we've got a complex set of interrelated problems we've got to manage to solve at once? Could it be the post-war Marshall Plan? We had an external environment where what we needed was reconstruction. 
and the strategy was one of growth. Grow the economy, build the dams, make stuff happen, rebuild. And that all makes sense. It absolutely made sense. And we developed the political, economic, social, technological, legal institutions, Bretton Woods, you name it, that empowered and drove that growth strategy. But could it be that what we've seen, particularly in the last 10 years, is a shift in the external environment? And the shift in the external environment is, of course, that we've started to run into the constraints to unlimited growth. We've just started to hit it, as the Katrina slides show. And the question then is, how do you achieve congruence? If there is that shift in the external environment, what is the new strategy? Is it to abandon growth? As Adair Turner says, growth must be dethroned. Is it to go for green growth in OECD countries? Is it to go for a form of inclusive growth that also addresses other megatrends? First question is, what is the strategy that is going to be congruent with the new external environment? The second question then is, how do you manage to create congruence in the system? What is the political environment that will either inhibit that strategy working or allow it to work? What are the economics around carbon pricing, around incentives, you name it, that will work and not just be congruent with the new strategy, but of course be congruent with the politics? What are the social implications? What will the cultural changes be that are required? What are the technologies and what are the legal implications of this? And the session next week is to look at these multiple levels of congruence or incongruence and the shift that we're going to have to achieve in order to come up with a set of strategies that can actually take the current economic model that we've got and make it fit for purpose in terms of the megatrends that it faces. And with that, it is 6.05. We totally salute you for your heroic patience in sitting through the whole thing. And I think we've got, we got some time for questions insofar as people have questions. And all very complex questions should go towards Mick and so on, please.